Hello and uh, welcome to uh, this short conversation. Um, I'm, my name is Tom Clayton, I work for Melville House UK and um, we're here today to talk with uh, one of my authors, Jamie Fahey, who's just released a fabulous book about sports of futsal. And I'm gonna hold up the book there so there's some good uh, attention. Uh, it contains a foreword by Belgium coach, Roberto Martinez, and um, it's a comprehensive history of the indoor sport of futsal. Uh, now, probably the first thing you're gonna be asking is, what on earth is futsal? So I'm going to throw to Jamie and um, he's going to explain to you in one minute or less <laughs> um, what futsal is and we'll take it from there. We've had some lovely questions from uh, people on Twitter and from Facebook as well and we're really grateful for that and we're also very grateful to Reading Library who are hosting us in uh, this little video. So uh, off we go. No pressure Jamie. Um, let's go for uh, a, a quick summation of uh, what futsal is to start with, and then we'll go straight into the question. Okay, so futsal uh, looks like football. Um, its origins, the main origins are in football as well as other sports, but it uh, feels like basketball. It's an intensely counter-attacking rapid game played on a 40 by 20 meter court, preferably indoors, normally indoors. It's five aside, there's no offsides. It's, uh, it's the sport that began in 1930 in, uh, in Uruguay, and it's seen as the laboratory of improvisation in Brazil, which is the country that is synonymous with the game. It's the FIFA-sanctioned indoor five-a-side game, and it's, it's a game that many, many of the most potent 11-a-side footballers the world has ever seen credit with uh, honing their skills as children. I think that might be under a minute. That was very good. Very, very good. Okay, right. So you spent a number of years uh, of writing this book now, um, and it's, it's a really, truly sort of global span that you cover, um, everywhere from uh, the States to all over Europe to the Far East. It's a, a, a really sort of global vision. Um, and the first question we have here is, uh, what was the most fascinating or surprising aspect you discovered about futsal? When researching the book, I'm mean, because you're you know considered an expert already. Was there anything that really shocked you? Well, the, the biggest thing um, was was the absence of clear and verifiable information, and obviously the language barrier made that difficult for me. Lots in Portuguese, lots in Spanish, but it was the absence of information combined with a real depth of feeling and an intensity of debate about the origins of the game. As I say, I touched on in that one minute start point there. It began in 1930 in Uruguay, on the back of Uruguay, winning the Football World Cup, and uh, an Argentinian professor of PE decided to get people indoors. There was a mass clamour to play football, but most of the pitches outdoor were privatised, and there's a disproportionate amount of rainfall in Uruguay. Who knew that? That was a surprise to me. But getting people indoors to play a game, that was an amalgam of three or four different sports, including water polo, handball, basketball, and football. So, from that moment onwards, the became, it, it, basically there was a, a decades long custody battle over the game. And this really surprised me because for me, it was synonymous with Brazil. And I'll get onto that. That was one of the main reasons that drove me to find out more about this game. <laughs> Growing up in Liverpool as a passionate um, advocate of Brazilian football and all, all the samba flair that that involved. So basically in a nutshell, Uruguay claimed the, the, the origins of the sport, which seems to be agreed, but it was raised in Brazil. And, and so these disputing parents, if you like, were fighting a custody battle over the, over the sport in the subsequent decades. And so eventually in 1971, a, 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 an organization called FIFUSA was founded to look after the sport. Eventually FIFA got involved. This was a complex, turbulent period that the ramifications of which are still playing out today. There is a rival organization to FIFA, uh, much less significant, much less, um, important but still it claims to be the original uh, uh, organization that led futsal so that was interesting i sort of knew that but finding out and trying to negotiate the the the, the um the the facts if you like but as ever you can only find out what's available there that was difficult the other thing that was part of my journey the other thing that made um, 
made me sit up and take notice is when I first started coaching the sport, which was in about 2008. And I also started playing in my 40s. And this, remember, is a sport that one of the biggest things that stunned me about it is the fitness required to play it because it's absolutely unforgiving. And in the elite professional futsal, you'll only be on the, the court. Each player, even the best player in the world, will only be on the court for maybe 20 minutes out of a 40-minute match. Uh, and you'll be on for anything from 30 seconds for a set piece to six, seven, eight minutes if you can last that long. And then you're off. Because there's no hiding on court. It's constant. It's, it's, uh, it's a game where every player has to be constantly aware of the strategy at the moment, constant counter-attacking. So that was a massive uh, eye-opener for me when I was playing it, the fitness required and the, the unexpected returns in the game. People see the, the stars of football who've played futsal, the dribblers, the Ronaldinho's, the Ronaldo's of old and the Portuguese Cristiano, who also credits it with his... Um, his impeccable ball skills um but it's the off the ball stuff the movement without possession the the, the defensive awareness and the tactical uh, knowledge needed to play the game at the highest level and that also isn't required at my amateur level that i played and with the kids i've coached over the years and they were really unexpected returns for me of the game and what it does to propel players to play whether it's futsal or move on to 11 a side where the space is bigger the time you have is much bigger cool. What was the most enjoyable chapter that you worked on? The, the chapters are broken down into um, it variously into sort of continents or countries. And I wondered if there was one which particularly stood out for you as being very pleasurable to write. Well, it would be no surprise to say that the chapter on Brazil was incredibly pleasurable. But before I got to that stage, the first four or five chapters, I interspersed the history of futsal with my own growth of knowledge and journey in the game, whether from a kid in Liverpool in the 70s and 80s playing street football. And that, of course, is where the massive parallel comes for me because that intensity I had discovered and enjoyed on the streets in Liverpool in the 70s and 80s, that was matched when I started playing futsal. Suddenly, it was totally immersive, a breathless game, and you're just always involved. There was no sitting about on the left wing like there can be in 11-a-side football, not touching the ball for 10 minutes. You're always involved. But yeah, the Brazil chapter, to go back to what I was saying, it was discovering just how essential Brazil was to the to the, to the origins and to the the game itself, and 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 I I was really fortunate to have some really really invaluable help with uh, the language. So I interviewed the the esteemed coach of the Brazilian futsal national team, Marquinhos Xavier in London when he was doing a guest coaching session at one of the strongest teams in the country, um, futsal teams, that's London Helvetia. And I had the England futsal captain, Rayoni Medina, um, translating, and, and it was wonderful. Uh, oh, and Leo, the coach at Helvetia at the time. Uh, really, really helpful. And I saw firsthand the detail, the technical and tactical detail involved in putting on a coaching session uh, at the elite level and it blew my mind that was amazing and to try and distill that into the wider cultural phenomenon that is Brazilian football and futsal was 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 challenging but it was really rewarding and then I get to, got to write about all the great Brazilian footballers and the great, great Brazilian futsal players like Sue Falcao the most famous futsal player of all just Google him or look on YouTube and you'll see the most amazing goals that he scored. More than 400 goals in 250 appearances for Brazil. Uh, astonishing. So I got to distill this and, 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 and write a little bit about the culture of the game. Um, going from, as I say, the fo football players who played the game right from Pelé and Rivellino right up to Neymar and Rodrigo at Real Madrid now, Vinicius at Real Madrid. All these stars, many of them have come to the Premier League as well. Great. Um... I think it's fair to say that the book has had its fair share of challenges as well, as has the game itself um, in the last couple of years. But what was the most challenging aspect of, of writing the book for you? So uh, the language barrier aside, that, that was difficult. But as I said, I had some wonderful help from people who I half knew and people, good friends and futsal colleagues in Reading, um, such as Ricardo, one of the many uh, people in the Portuguese community here, Ricardo Medeiros, our futsal goalkeeper. He went with me to Portugal, 
and translated interviews and helped me out there massively. But the other one, and this is the this is the 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 the, uh, the really fascinating thing. The other one is almost like a, a microcosm or a mirror image of the biggest challenge in futsal, and that was finding the time and space to actually do the job. Basically, on a futsal court, it's like thirty-seven aside uh, equivalent in eleven in eleven side football. You, difficult to find time and space. And now I've got a full-time job. Uh, I'm coaching, playing. I've got to be a husband, a, a father. I'm finding a time and space to actually write the thing. That was really, really difficult. So it led to me on some bizarre... Um, I ended up writing chapters in the most bizarre places. The most common one was on the train. Um, I, I live in Reading, going into Paddington. The fast train takes half an hour. And I worked out that my sweet spot of writing was... I didn't get go until half an hour in. So I decided to get the long train that took an hour and a half and went to Waterloo. And that last hour of writing was, I found that inspirational and really, really effective in getting plenty of words down. As you might remember, Tom, probably too many words. There's nothing like a bit of uh, time pressure to get the creativity flowing, is there? <laughs> indeed, indeed. So that was the biggest challenge, just finding the time, because I had all the contact, had all the interviews, I'd been places, I'd, I'd had lots of content, but just needed to distill it and find the time to write. Sure. I think I probably know the answer to this next question already, but what was your most memorable interview in the book? Well, it's interesting. Do you know the answer? That's the thing. So there were so many. I, I, I mean, the people I'd never met before, from um, Shahzad Mosafar, the celebrated Iranian women's national futsal team coach. Uh, she used to be the first, she was the first futsal, football coach for the national team after the revolution as well. Um, various futsal luminaries such as Makin, as I mentioned, Mitchell Martic, the um, Croatian coach who's coach of Finland. So many people, um, but the, the two that stand out, I think you might, uh, you might be alluding to Roberto Martinez, who I interviewed, perhaps. That was amazing, exhilarating ex Everton manager and someone who's a massive advocate of um, youth as a youth coach and also the benefits of futsal as a football development tool which is half of the story I have to state that because futsal is very much a, a sport in its own right but I think the biggest one was was perhaps my trip to Lisbon to interview Ricardinho who took over from Falcao as the biggest star in the futsal firmament he is the man basically won the won Player, player, global player of the year for six years, six times, five on the bounce. And I interviewed him in his backyard in Lisbon, uh, well, actually in Rio, New York, about 40 miles north. And we had this most wonderful time where we spent an hour and a half with him. Ricardo was there with me, plus another teammate from Reading, um, Chris Ryman. And, um, and we got a ball out after I'd chatted to him. And we even recreated, for anyone who's of the right age. We were even recreated in the style of fantasy football's um, Phoenix from the Flames in the 1990s, recreated an own goal that I scored in Reading back in our amateur ways. And Ricardino took part in this and that was wonderful. But but yeah, he, he taught culture, he taught futsal in, in Portugal, he taught football in Portugal. And he told me about his journey from a kid in the poverty strip in Porto to becoming the biggest futsal star in the world. And that was, that was really, really uh, informative and it sort of lit up the book if you like and was a centerpiece around which I could build all the other chapters. Mm, mm. That was the one I was thinking of, thank goodness. Oh brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> this next one is excellent, okay so it's uh, which, uh, so Futsal has had an influence on, on a lot of superstar footballers now and a few have made it through to the Premier League and a few would say that futsal has been a huge influence on the way that they play and the way that they think on the pitch and so this question is what five premier league players i think we will say past and present here shall we um yeah what, that's fine. what five premier league players would you pick to create your fantasy futsal team okay the so past and present changes things so so because i discounted cristiano ronaldo obviously um, although he did play, but he has to go in now. So, so, so let's start from the back. So in futsal, the, the goalkeeper is absolutely essential. Arguably the most important player on the court um, because there is what we used to call it uh, goalie in and out when we were playing on the streets in Liverpool or rush goalie, a lot of people say. The keeper can come out at any moment and it is actually a really effective strategy in futsal called you going fly goalkeeper where the keeper comes out and you make it five before in the, in the opposition half 
I must say there is a restriction on goalkeepers uh, to be being in possession of for four seconds while in their own half and they can't touch it again after they've released it until they're in the other half or the opposition has touched it. So that makes it even more difficult to play out. But goalkeepers, yeah, I mean, David De Gea started the, started the, um, the pattern of, of, of goalkeepers who were obviously had a different skill set saving with these split saves with their feet. Um, be interesting, we played futsal as a boy, but mainly as a pivot, as a striker, a goal scorer. So he probably just uh, picked up those skills along the way. But these days, there are two who stand out and they are Brazilian and that's Edison at Man City and Alisson, uh, Alisson Becker at Liverpool. And um, when it comes down to it, I'll have to go for Edison because he's admitted that his, his, his ferocious shooting and his ability with his feet was honed on a futsal court. So he'd be my, my, my flying goalkeeper. Then at the back, the position in futsal is known as a fixo, which is the, the main man at the back, really. Plenty of options from, from Thiago at, at Liverpool. I don't think I've seen another player in the Premier League who, whose whole skill set just screams out futsal. From the sole control to the, the ability to just swivel and turn, disguise on his passes, nutmeg passes from 10 yards inspiration all those skills are, are formed on a futsal court um, then there's um, Jorginho at, at, at Chelsea um, Allen at Everton who again grew up playing futsal uh, played for a futsal club before he turned to 11 aside where he linked up with Philip Coutinho another great um, futsal advocate and and uh, they played at Vasco da Gama together um, so I think um, but the one who has to go at the back for me is the only one who's ever played in the Premier League who's actually played a futsal international and that's Wolverhampton Wanderers Max Kilman played 25 caps for England he'd have the futsal now and as I've said it's a hugely tactical game and when speaking to Max a couple of times, I've spoken to him about futsal, interviewed him, he, he told me that one of the massive things that he learned from futsal, which has allowed him to thrive in the Premier League, is his tactical awareness and speed of thought. Bravery on the ball as well, but those the tactical awareness. So Max would have to be there at the back, um, edging out all these luminaries with numerous caps for their country at football then wingers in futsal it's very common and effective to have inverted wingers which is which means you've got a right footer on the left and vice versa a lefty on the right so obviously i'd probably have to put cristiano ronaldo here i was going to put richarlison in there because he grew up playing futsal as a boy and he has all the hallmarks of a futsal player but cristiano ronaldo would have to be on the left cutting inside and doing whatever he wants to get goals on the opposite side Again, there, there are plenty of options here for a, for a, for a, a left footer cutting inside. Given that you've allowed me to have players who are no longer in the Premier League, it's probably going to have to be David Silva. Again, probably the finest uh, exponent of the, the, the art form that is the classic number 10 uh, in, in football. And all those skills um, are synonymous with futsal. Uh, ability to receive on the half turn, the, you know, they can both, go both ways, they know what they're going to do before they receive the ball. Speed of time, the, 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 the ability to cope in, 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 without time and space to think, astonishing. He, uh, he, he, he effectively rules out um, Riyad Mahrez, which I was going to go for. He, he grew up playing uh, organised street football in the banlieues of northern Paris, along with Wissam Ben Yedda, actually. He was the uh, same age as him, and Wissam Ben Yedda, who obviously is in the France national football team now, also, like Max Kilman, played futsal for his country. He played for France uh, in his late teens. So um, that's, uh, that, that's what we've got with the wingers. And then the pivot, the striker, uh, it, it's different in futsal. Uh, you, you know, you need different skill sets to be, to be a pivot, an attacker. Roberto Firmino is absolutely a joy to watch at Liverpool. He plays like he's playing a pivot in futsal. And there are plenty of other options. Sergio Aguero might have done it, although his all-round game perhaps might have let him down. Um, but, um, yeah, as a goal scorer. But the one that is undeniable, the one that I've got to go for, is the, the man who does this a lot for club and country. Um, plays in the false nine, which is the equivalent of a pivot when you're playing 4-0, which is where everyone just rotates and comes back into line. You don't have a fixed point up there. And that's Kevin De Bruyne at Man City. And Roberto Martin has told me how he knew of his futsal origins as a boy. And he uses him at Belgium in this false nine because he has this immaculate skill set to allow him to thrive in that position. Plenty of more that I could go through because in the futsal squad, you tend to have 14 in the squad, but 
um, you can imagine. Uh, I, I will um, I will leave it at that. That's a pretty formidable lineup, though, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think you struggle to beat them. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Well, well, I mean, another one I can give you off the top of my head is Emilio Martinez, the um, Aston Villa goalkeeper. Uh, he credits Futsal with his impeccable skills on the ball. Then Kante at Chelsea, he'd be an amazing Futsal player, just playing as that that, that fixo role. Then Jack Grealish, Phil Foden, they'd be astonished. I'd love to see them play in Futsal. And, um, and Mo Salah, of course. Plenty of others. This next question speaks to um, the more social side of the book and, and the kind of message that it brings with um, introducing a sense of play and improvisation to schools and to the way that sport and especially football and futsal is, is taught in schools. Uh, and it's, uh, we would have loved futsal at school. Why haven't we heard of it? Well, um, the, the person who asked that question, I guess, grew up the same time as I did in the 1980s. I was born in 1971, so 70s and 80s. And it's fascinating because obviously back then, football in this country, the culture was from your age, I don't know, six, seven, eight, you're playing on this massive 11 aside pitch with goals three times the height of the goalkeeper, um, never touching the ball. And the biggest, the biggest, the, the biggest, the time when you got the most practice at actually playing football was on the street when you're playing with your mates. And you, there was, you know, you wouldn't design a goal that was way too big on the street. You wouldn't design a, a game where you didn't get touches of the ball. You know, it was a battle to play, but everyone wanted to take part. So, so we had that that made up for the, the deficit of play, really. Um, that's changed. So, and this is one of the big points I make in the book that I, my view is the death of street football has left this void that we've never replaced. And that means that for me, futsal is ready-made to step into that void and offer this breathless intensity of constant involvement in a game that gives you all the repetition that you need to do to thrive. But back in the eighties, of course, we did have the conventional British five-a-side, which is still really popular now. And that has actually prevented futsal taking off in many ways. And Britain's not alone in, in that happening. Um, I think in Italy there was an issue with the, their version of five-a-side, almost suppressing the growth of futsal. It eventually has grown, and they've got a professional league there, adult league. But yeah, in the 80s, and of course futsal was unheard of because it was going through its massive transition in the 80s as well. FIFA started to get involved in the 80s. So up to that point, it was predominantly a South, a South American game, although it had come into Europe, into Belgium, Portugal, Spain in the 70s and, and 80s. But Britain, it was pretty much non-existent, non-existent, and certainly in England. Of course, England formed their futsal team, first futsal team in 2003, although they did dabble in the late 80s with some games, but it was all unofficial and not FIFA sanctioned. And obviously, once it becomes FIFA sanctioned, then you'd expect it to get to become uh, something that kids can play in schools. That actually leads us quite nicely into the into the next question, which and the final question here, which is: um, What kind of environmental factors are the most important for Sal to thrive? And I think that's probably, you know, it speaks to the, the street football culture you were just talking about. Um, yeah, did maybe if maybe you could speak to those kind of um, uh, the, the way that we the things that could usher futsal into society a bit more. Well, first thing, and you know, um, kudos to anyone who solves this one. But in in England or in Britain, having three hundred days of bright sunshine a year would help enormously. So then you could play outdoors a lot more. Um, but obviously we're not going to get that. And obviously places like Spain and Brazil, they do. And that's the massive advantage they have because futsal can be played on a hard surface outdoors. Um, remember the two big things, the two big things that define futsal are the hard surface and the ball. The ball is weighted, it's heavier, and it doesn't bounce as much. It's not up in the air. It's not scrambling about for headers and second balls. It's controlled precision with the ball. So apart from that, the, the massive issue, and this, is, this became apparent, having conducted interviews with various people in various countries, Brazil, Spain, Portugal, uh, the USA, 
uh, and the massive driver to any form of futsal taking off or growing is schools. It has to become the game of the schools, as it is in Brazil, Spain. In primary age, that's what they play. That's their game. And and obviously, the 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 depth of the uh, the uh, the depth of growth of the sport uh, or the roots of the sport, sorry, um, are reflected in that because you got thousands and thousands of schools all having futsal as their game. And in England, if you look at the figures, I think there are 25,000 schools in, in England. I think about 18,000 of those are primary, 4,000 secondary, and then um, 3,000 3, colleges and private schools. All of those have a hall. Most of them will have an outdoor court, courtyard space, which where you could fit a futsal court. If you just had the futsal goals in the hall or one or two futsal balls around, with the rules known, then you'd instantly have kids playing on their own, which is in effect what we did as kids playing street football. You play it on your own, it's self-guided, and that's a massive, that's a massive driver, in my opinion, to uh, kids learning the game and learning to love a ball, the mastery of a ball, is the, the, the autonomy and the self-direction, not having an adult. In the worst cases of football coaching in, in, in England, you've got an adult telling people what they can't do all the time and not encouraging them to play, experiment and, and learn how to win. And, and that, that's, that's a massive driver. So yeah, game of the schools, and, and obviously that then needs the backing of the authorities, the, the FA. The FA in England has shown a very um, um, lukewarm embrace of futsal. It's gone up and down. And at the minute we're in one of the down spirals, which, which hopefully we'll come out of. Um, but um, the, uh, the game itself requires backing from the authorities. So the FA would need to get involved, but make it the game of the schools. And I think it will soon, it would probably take over from our conventional five-side football. Thank you very much for answering all of those questions, Jamie. Um, Futsal, Story of an Indoor Football Revolution, is released by Melville House UK on the 1st of July. Uh, thank you again to Jamie. Thank you for, to all of you for sending in your questions and thank you to Reading Library for hosting us here. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye.